Well, hello, everybody. It is your favorite day of the week. It is time for another episode of the Reality Reading Rainbow, where I talk about books written by reality stars, uh, primarily Bravo celebrities, and I try to make sense of them. I also do interviews, and today is an interview day. And this is someone who we were just chatting before I started this up. And this is someone who I feel like I already know you. Like we started talking and I was like, wait a minute, this is, we're just actually meeting for the first time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so this is a friend of mine who I've become friendly with on Clubhouse, but you may recognize him from the late great show, The People's Couch, May It Rest in Peace. And it really does need to come back. Welcome my friend Emerson Collins. Hey, Emerson. Ah, uh, Les, I am so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. There is a furniture graveyard somewhere with all of our couches, just little tombstones sitting on the back of where each of us sat. Of course, I'm still sitting on my couch yelling at the television. There's just not cameras watching it anymore. So, I mean, for, so, so first of all, how did, how did the, uh, the people's couch come about? Were you approached by an agent or how did this happen? We, Scott, that was the third on our couch with me and Blake, he was up for another show through this casting office and decided not to do it. And then they said, we're working on this new idea thing. Do you have any friends you watch TV with? And I was absurdly available and said, <laughs> absolutely, I'll sit on your couch and watch television. I don't understand what's happening, but sure. And so they did an audition process. We did a Skype interview with the three of us and Scott fully, like, in the lockdown pandemic era, we've all learned to be our own at-home tech crews, like turning table lamps on their side to use as fill lights. But we were doing that back then to like set up this glorious shot. And we talked with them for a while. Then the next round of casting, they played video clips of various things and just sat and watched us respond to it. And they said, you don't need to talk the whole time. We're like, oh, right. that's, but that's what we do. Um, and then after that, it was the, the three episode trial series and we were off and running. It's so crazy because the reason why I started watching The People's Couch is because um, I met Scott because Scott used to co-host Musical Mondays with my friend Ryan. Yes. So, so I was flipping channels one day and I was like, oh, there's Scott. And so that's how I started watching the show. That's amazing. <laughs> and then realize that, oh my God, the show is fantastic. You know, and that's how I started watching. Interesting adventure because uh, now I'm an actress first. Right. I'm a producer to make the money and pay the bills. And the original pitch, there was a little bit of like, okay, this could be like the death knell of entertainment television. Like people on their couches, watching people on their couches watch television. This like TV inception concept. So we honestly were like, this could ruin anything else we try to do. Uh, but it was so rewarding that it became this charming, wonderful community. I still get messages all the time from people like, what did you think about this show? I get right. cameo books that are just like, tell me what you thought of Drag Race last week. And we, it was this wonderful, fun community and an incredibly positive group online, like live tweeting through the shows on Tuesdays and then on Sundays and then on Fridays as we bounced around the Bravo schedule, like that little sing-along ball. Uh, and so it became this really lovely thing that like smart, funny people identified with the like, we all do that. We sit and like disagree and laugh and argue about our television. And I feel like we were really lucky to get to do it for so long. And the thing is though, what I like about that show is everybody on the show was likable, like everybody. And yeah. I loved how they showed like the range of people between you three and then the the, the family with the, the dad and his daughter. Yes. And then the other family, the what was it? They had like three boys and they were all yeah. sitting on the bed. We had that and I liked the bed. And and then what I liked about it is they showed the same shows and a lot of times the response from people were the same. And so it showed the world that no matter what we look like, we all like the same stuff. We have pretty much similar opinions. And I really like that a lot. Yeah, well, and I loved that because there is, there's certain kinds of things that, oh, universally, we're all reacting to this as I love it, or I hate it, or like, oh, that's gross. And then also when we didn't respond the same, it was a great insight 
into how different kinds of people respond to different kinds of entertainment. Right. Or even if we all love it, like what our main entry love thing is a little bit different and seeing that perspective, you know, in the midst of this essentially like clip show, I thought was like a really fun insight, particularly into like the greater Bravo extended universe. And the thing is though, when you all did have a difference of opinion, it wasn't nasty. Like it yeah. was just, you just had a difference of opinion. Yeah. And it was well, still funny. And not to climb onto like a soapbox about the internet that we definitely agree on. You know, part of entertainment culture, I love watching everything. Like I'm basic. I will watch almost anything. If you want to watch it, I'm in. I, I, I can. I don't have to even like it to have a good time watching it with you. But like my big thing is we don't know these people. You know, fiction, those are not real people. Reality shows, I don't know that person. They don't live in my life. But like we should be able to argue and debate and discuss and like not have it change how we engage with each other as people on a fundamental level. Right. Because right. like we aren't changing what's happening on the screen. Right. So okay. Let's like enjoy all there is to discuss and the really important, interesting things that are come up to discuss as well, but engage with each other as like people with feelings and treat each other with respect and conversations as long as that respect is maintained and earned. You know, I'm not saying, you know, somebody's an asshole to you, let right. them have it. But you right. know, like I enjoy the like kiki of like loving, hating, agreeing, disagreeing together and then being like, so anyway, what's next? Well, and it's so funny that you mentioned that because now and for, and my, for me personally, it seems like it's changed overnight because Bravo, it's kind of, it's not like that anymore. And now yeah. it could become very contentious. And, and uh, like, and, and you having been a part of the network and having been a part of the fun time, how do you feel about that? Because it's changed a lot. I think one, I want to divide, right? There's two kinds of like, conflict that have created like interesting internet carol versus bethany teresa versus the rest of the new jersey that kind of like bonkers internet behavior is like unacceptable and like mind-blowing to me you know like or the beverly hills like lucy lucy apple juicy like y'all that stuff is not important it does not like kiki whatever but you're not in that real friendship that's one kind of thing now the other, the more important and what we're talking about now is seeing our real social issues uh, move into these spaces so that the reality TV is reflecting much more of our actual reality. Right. What I think we're seeing in the discussions around it, I think Clubhouse has been a huge forum for bringing people together to really discuss beyond the, the core content, the implications. What we're seeing is how different groups of people have been watching separately and now we're able to communicate and say, oh, I perceive this this way. Me as a different kind of person perceive that this way. And now let's talk about how our outside differences mirror some of the conflict we're seeing on the screen. And that piece I think is amazing. I think that's important. I think it's an, it's an elevation. Weirdly, it's almost back to what like the original real world was, where it was like when people stop being polite and start getting real and you had like, Melissa throwing a chair in New Orleans and like, you know, the real religious, gay, race conversations of early real world. It's like, here we are 25 years later and that's finally seeping in to the greater Bravo conversation. And I love it. It's so funny that you mentioned the real world because did you see the reunion? I haven't. Oh, 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 oh. I, loved it. I, I won't spoil it for you, but it was just very interesting to see how the conversation evolved. Yeah. Because- and also sometimes how it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. And, and once again, without, you know, spoiling anything, at one point, one of, remember Kevin from the first one who was always yeah. talking about race and a couple of them sat him down and said, you know what, you were right. And everything that's happening now is, stuff that you talked about 30 years ago and we didn't yeah. listen yeah. so and and it's it's interesting right because it's also there's a growing pain happening as well because we're seeing across now like multiple back-to-back -back franchises in the universe the the ugly <laughs> how ugly it can be to start hard conversations 
Um, and I'm hopeful and excited to see that like we stick with it, right. you know, because one of the hardest things when you get into talking about race and sexuality or religion is the uncomfortableness of starting the conversation when you're the historically the historic beneficiary like me as a white man. But if I'm not willing to be in the conversation and like mess up and have somebody call me in and help me redirect, you know, we, we can't go anywhere. So does that make sense? It's like, it's been yeah. hard to watch, but I hope that leads to better. Now this is, so this is, so you, you mentioned like the, the mess up. This is what I, in my opinion, find that a lot of times the disconnect is, and maybe you can speak on this. So I'm black. I'm talking to a person who was not. Yep. And something goes down, maybe something is said, which one of the ways that things have changed, I think after last year is a lot of times before someone would say something and it would be a microaggression or borderline offensive, maybe the person didn't know, but a lot of times as the person of color, you would stuff it and say anything and let it go. You know, now after last summer, something is said, and a lot of times you say something, but you don't say it's not, and, and it's not like you asshole, you did da 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 da. A lot of times it's, hey, you know what? When you said I was articulate, that just didn't sit well with me, and this is why. Now, when the, where the disconnect I think comes in is, when you tell the person, hey, this is what happened. This is why I feel this way. And I'm just telling you this as a friend, just so you know, the person receiving it then a lot of times gets defensive and doubles down or fights back with you. And that's where the disconnect happens. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Well, it's like, so we all know there's so many levels and layers to this. So I'm going to bumble along through, right? Because there's one kind of conversation you have with a friend. There's one kind of conversation you have with an acquaintance. And there's one kind of a conversation you have with a stranger, right? Mm -hmm. So we see on camera, both kinds of conversations happen. Acquaintance conversations, which is more in the vein of like, I'm meeting these people for the first time and I don't know you. So I, I the grace that I have to give you is less. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, unfortunately, for better or for worse, it puts the onus on Black people, these Black women, these Asian women, people of color, to give the grace, right? And that's exhausting. And like, one, I'll tell you, in my, my own journey, one of the hardest things for me early on to get over was the idea of like, yeah, but look at the, what they meant. Look at their intention. You know, the flip side, because I can relate to it a little bit as a gay man, but it's different because I'm still a cis white man in society. And when I walked down the street, the understanding that like there is not room in so many marginalized people's lives to extend grace to every person, every time on everything. You know, that's its own kind of epic life draining. And so the expectation of that is inherently unfair. So like I want to start there because that's right. often what leads to what you're talking about, right? Well, I didn't mean, okay, great. There is a way to explain. My intention was after someone says, this is what I received, that isn't the same as excusing if it is accompanied by the sincere apology of the effect it had, I, right? With right. a friend or with someone you're friendly with where you can say, oh, I meant this. I'm so sorry that that is what you received. I will change that behavior, that language, right? Because that's, particularly with microaggressions. You know, it's like, this is the, the chipping away through the day, through the week, through the month, through the year on marginalized people, particularly people of color. That it's like, I, I feel, you watch people in my life now that I'm paying more attention and understanding, you see the like, is this worth, or do I just let this one like, you know? And that's the thing we as white people like will never understand or ever relate to. And so it is why we, when we watch the white person on camera go, oh, but are you more concerned with seeming racist or that your words or actions felt racist to the person who you are talking to? 
that feels like that's where the like defensive thing comes from, right? Some some of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, it and, and it, this and this is my stand on it too, especially. So I am married to a white person who is not American. So it's you know so. I realized I was having a couple of conversations and I realized, hey, he just doesn't know. Yeah. And it's nothing, and, and there's no malice behind this or not. He just doesn't know. And, he, and, and, and I'm not saying he said anything offensive because he hasn't, but there's been a couple of questions that he's asked like, okay, so why is blah, blah, blah offensive? I don't understand. And that's when I realized, oh, you know, if if it's not in your scope, if it's not in your reality, how can you understand? Yep. You know? It is where like our, our lived experiences arrive at moments so different. And there are some things that are just, I have never had to consider that perspective. I actually thought the articulate microaggression was a great example of that. Because obviously that's a word used in life and in, in, in you can be used in lots of things and lots of reasons. Having been paying attention in this space for years and years, that is something I have known for a very long time that is a particular trigger point. But I watched other people, not in defending, but watched how many people said, I didn't know. Right. And that's also how much attention are you paying? How much participation are you doing in these conversations to encounter these things? Because like there's things that are like touching a black person's head, you know, like there are things we like, you should not need to be told. That's weird regardless, you know, but, but in the nuanced places and how people respond to that says a lot. Like you can just say, I did not know, I will change and not do that. And in my life, my black friends, people of color I know will go, great, thank you for that. We will move right. on. Right. Uh, but how you receive the criticism, like how we receive the criticism on our side, has so as everything to do with how we move forward. It's like the, the night and day difference between Kyle and Garcelle's conversation and Sutton and everything else. You know, like one version is that, thank you for sharing your experience with me. That was not my intention. I am sorry that that was the impact and I will not do that, you know? Right. And you see how easy it went and it was done. It was done, done. Also, it's like why we white people, right? Need to understand Black people don't want to be having these conversations. You know, our really Asian don't. friends don't want to be talking about this. Latino friends, like nobody wants to be talking about this all day, every day. I know you want to sit down and just watch our stories the same way right? I sit down and watch our stories and not have to do the great race convention breakdown the next day because something happened, you know, it's like right. no, nobody wants to do this. So when it's necessary, we have to show up and receive those criticisms to for all of us to move on. It's like, yeah, because I get it. It's like, I want to sit down and watch the show where Taryn yells at Giselle for sitting in her seat at her yes. birthday party. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. I mean, I, you, did you watch Beverly Hills last night? Absolutely. Okay. I wanted to talk. Actually, I was exhausted and wanted to go to bed, but then after texting with you and you yeah. said it was good, I sat down immediately and watched it. Let's, let's break it down. Let's okay. talk about it. Like the first half of the episode, whatever, but like one of my favorite episodes of Housewives in quite some time. That yes. final party at Lisa Rinna's house was fully God tier reality television Housewives performance from every member of the cast. I mean, my journey into it. So we have Garcelle as the birthday girl receiving the fabulous, absurd, ridiculous. Beverly Hills expensive presents that we want to see. Uh, we have Kyle pulling Sutton aside to the bar as the like grand matron of Beverly Hills knowing we need to make this scene over here. Sutton saying she prays to Jesus and why can't he throw her a bone and drink <laughs> that vodka bottle as if it was Jesus. Well, Dorit checked her makeup in the camera on her phone, Erica, Parted the vines like she was on a jungle safari. Lisa Rinna running around the party. Kathy Hilton, the hunky dory moment. And then Lisa, it's your party. You gotta go do something about this. Every one of them walking across the grass in heels they could not walk across the grass in. All leading up to Crystal's smirk at the end of the episode. 
I mean, this is the housewives that I want. And throw and in the, the throw in the ugly leather pants line. I mean, uh, you're the, the like crystals left turn at you're just jealous, leading all the way to the like ugly leather pants, like the 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 smug crystals, like you live on another planet. I mean, this is the kind of arguing I love. This is the nonsense. It's like a pandemic. Nowhere they're in lockdown. No one has anywhere to go. Like, and we've got a whole nother set piece next week in the same party. I can't wait. And, 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 and the, the funny thing is, you know it's gonna be good when they show the scene, you have the voiceover, and then it goes three days early. It's like, okay, God. Correct. <laughs> also, that since the trailer release of this show, we've all been waiting for that. What am I jealous of? Her ugly leather pants. Like that, that is an iconic line that we built to in the trailer from the top of the season, from the top of the episode. And then seeing how we got there and then Crystal just standing with that tiny smirk on her face, hands in pockets, like what? I mean, amazing. Right? And, and, and I gotta say, cause after last year, I was pretty much done with Beverly Hills. Yeah. I was done. Yeah. And I got to give them, if there was the most improved award, Beverly Hills gets it. Yep. My issue with Beverly Hills, because has always been that it's by far the most like self-produced of the right. shows in the sense that because so many of these women really do work adjacent to entertainment, lots of entertainment-y things, there's always the guard up and you have to sort of watch it enjoying that. Like, how are they performing today's scene with each other? But it's also why some years we've had like one conflict last the whole season and you flip over to Atlanta and there's like three conflicts per episode and then they're giggling at the top of the next one and there's a new story point. Um, and so the, the, I don't think any of us, I, don't, I certainly didn't, the bonkers off the wall rich lady energy that is Kathy Hilton is one of the greatest gifts to housewives in years. Who knew? How could we possibly have known? <laughs> this was like... Like she's like the sleeper hit of the season, Kathy. It is, it is like she is in her own one woman production of Grey Gardens, bouncing around that giant estate, rolling out of bed when she feels like it. Who is hunky dory should go on t-shirts. Right, right. Like, the idea that she's never even heard that expression and then stopped a conversation because she thought we were talking about a new person. Like the levels that staying up all night in Tahoe, drinking Red Bull. Right. I mean, this is what happens when you have too much money in your life for too long. And now all I can understand is that I have so much more uh, almost sympathy for Kyle, imagining what is it like with the trio of them, Kathy, Kim, and Kyle? Because like we've seen Kyle talk to Kim and Kyle talk to Kathy. I am now desperate to see what a conversation looks like between Kim Richards and Kathy Hilton. How does that well, happen? Okay, so are you familiar with their background at all? Yes. Because they have a bonkers, yes. bonkers. A whole lot, background. I know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, and I was just talking about this yesterday in Clubhouse, um, in my room in, on Clubhouse, because um, their mom was pretty tough. Yes. And they basically grew up not only with this tough mother, they also basically, Kim and Kyle were pretty much breadwinners for the family. Yep. You know, and then, you know, the mom groomed Kathy to marry Rich, which she did. Yep. And so what I have always said is Kyle portrays herself as, you know, uh, with all of her phobias and very ultra sensitive. Uh, Kathy is like the, the dotty older lady. Yes. Kim is, as Lisa Vanderpump would call it, a broken bird. But under the exterior, these are tough women. Yes. Oh, yeah. They had I mean, to be. Have lived lives. I know because of your deep dives in the detective agency, you must feel the way I do. I end up on like Wikipedia, like wormholes while I'm watching shows. Because one night I got to the point where I realized that Paris Hilton is vaguely related to Zsa Zsa Gabor because of like Hilton marriages and Francesca. Yes. And I like can't let go of that tidbit. And then the whole, the thing that I read about Paris Hilton and Paris Jackson, both are named Paris because Michael and Kathy, when they were like 14 years old and another friend said they were all going to name 
their kids Paris and they it was did them Latoya right it was them and Latoya yeah yes. like Kathy please just sit on camera and talk about things that have happened to you however you want and then throw in the fact that Michael Latoya and Kathy were all best friends yes growing up and stayed best friends and are yes. still like I think Kathy and Latoya are still friends well when I read that like Kathy was one of the only people allowed to go to visit Michael's body because of like the true closeness of the families. Like that when he lived at one of the Hiltons for several months and all their kids played together. Like the fascination of how like celebrity lives cross over, particularly in an era where like, you know, we didn't have instant access to them. So we didn't know these things. Just fascinating. Kathy Hilton saving Beverly Hills. I mean, honestly. And, and the fact that like another thing that I read is when Michael Jackson died, Paris went to the house and picked up the kids. Oh, like, it's so fascinating. And then her just wandering around scenes now on this television show that her sister was like, you should do this with me in her pajamas going, sure, yeah, I can't see you. Are you Garcelle? Oh, I, that was amazing. I mean, the greatest, the greatest thing. Like, eardrops in the eyes. I don't know. I basically saw a pink shake, shape and long dark. Like, I mean, let's be honest. That was the only good example ever of I don't see color. Right. <laughs> like, right. Your, your tiny sister. Oh, and, epic. And it was so funny because on Clubhouse, that, because, you know, on Clubhouse, sometimes things turn into a thing. Yeah. So the Kathy mistaken mistaking Garcelle for Kyle was about to turn into a thing. And I had to say, listen, people, without my contact lenses, I am blind and I just see haze and shapes. Yes. And I would have done the same thing. I would have done the exact same thing. <laughs> also, I'm very curious and open to your response because to me that starts to get into a territory of like putting things on things that don't exist. Yes. Because that just the human statement of I could not tell which two people those two people were, right? Like that's the core right. of it. Right. It's obviously comical that in real life Garcelle and Kim and Kyle look nothing alike. But to want to take that and spin it into the other place sometimes becomes a disservice to the actual important conversational moments where we want to engage in. Am I right there? No, you're totally right. And unfortunately, I've been seeing that more lately where um, things that aren't racist are, okay, for example, um, I was on a Facebook group and they were, someone was, talking about oh that the, the black woman like they were describing I saw this picture this black woman was wearing this dress and someone just went up in arms like how dare you say that and once again I had to step in and and I, it's a, calling a person black is not racist right that, there's nothing wrong with that I am black and I I know a guy named Les and our nicknames for each other are black less and white less. And, white less. <laughs> <laughs> and so I and so I I do worry sometimes that simple things like this that mean nothing are starting to turn into things. There's nothing um, okay so in one in it said Facebook group uh so remember back when the racist stuff came out on Vanderpump Rules about the Maxes and their yes. tweets. Yeah. So um, ab about a week after that came out, um, I was uh, heading out, right? And I used to live, I used to live in West Hollywood. I used to live around the corner from like Pump and Sir and all those Amazing. places. And so I was walking up Robertson and I saw like a line down to Melrose of black people waiting to get into surf. Like a long, and I look inside, like I, cause you know how you can see inside, I kind of yeah. looked inside, black people, not a white person in sight. And so I jokingly put on Facebook, okay, I'm walking by sir, there's a line of black people. I guess they're having a black night because Lisa wants to make up for those tweets, right? <laughs> uh -huh. and, 
And plus living in LA, you know that different clubs have different nights and it is not unusual for a club to have a black night or an Asian night. It's a thing. Yeah. So I do it. I go out, I come home, go to bed, don't check my Facebook the rest of the day. I wake up the next day to all of these messages saying, you are a racist. How dare you do this? Why do you have to point out of a line of black people? Why can't it just be people? To the point that someone else in the group at one point in the thread took my picture saying, this is less. <laughs> this is uh-huh. what he looks like. And so it turned into this thing where I'm accused of being racist against black people just because I pointed out a line of black people. Right. That's where it gets dumb. Yes. You know? Well, and I feel like we all now, in these conversations, particularly if you engage in them a lot, you can tell the difference between sincerity that gets fumbly, humor that's meant to just be humor, and humor that's like, let's look at where that humor came from, you know? Um, and like when people can't read a joke joke as a joke joke, like, I, I don't know, there's a level of exhaustion of like, we do have to be able to laugh through these hard conversations as well because we're people trying to move through them together. Right. Like when you throw the baby out with the bathwater, like, what are we doing? And, and especially a situation like that where all they had to do was click on my picture. Right. And, and I'm surprised, like I was surprised the thread went as long as it did because I was like, can you just click on my my post right what I look like yes and it's also there's a there's an element of like us holding our own communities accountable sometimes you know for when we lob the big words at people like I can't talk about when something is or isn't racist because if your experience of it was racist I need to hear that and receive that and understand where that came from but I can do it with homophobia right Uh, and and there's sometimes my frustration in the response particularly to tv to entertainment you know to stuff that's outside of our personal sphere is sometimes someone isn't being homophobic racist or a bully they're being an asshole right and that's different right right you know my big one with like the bravo world is like most of the time nobody's getting bullied if you are a grown-up with another grown up, they may be being an asshole to you, but like the power differential that is required for the word bullied to apply, like that's inherent in the definition, right? Somebody who has more power than you, whether it's size, influence, whatever. But a lot of times that's a person just being an asshole, not a bully, and we should right. use the right word. What- now, question, so what do you, so um, what do you think about the whole like Stasi Vanderpump stuff? And especially now that, uh, Andy, I guess a couple of months ago, made a statement saying that maybe they shouldn't have fired them after all. I didn't ever hear the podcast because wasn't that the bigger piece of it? I'll, I'll, I'll be real honest. Until the like Clubhouse era, I've sort of been a like a, a show only content consumer. Okay, and and I didn't he- I didn't hear the podcast either. I did know about what they did to fake. So I personally was judging it on that. No, yes, yes, that absolutely, no, I remember that. That to me is the difference, right? I think there's lots of rooms to talk about old behavior, old word usage. I say that as someone who used to make jokes that were like, oh, I think I'm poking fun at racism, but actually I'm just being a little bit racist. No, that's fundamentally different. You put Faith's actual life in danger by engaging like police uh, uh, on to be funny for you and the relationship black people have with policing in our country? No, to me, that's fundamentally different. Apologies, I did remember that. And that's way across. Like that's not a minor microaggression we can watch somebody work through on camera. You know, that's not an educational opportunity. No, that's a like a, a something you did in your life that could have had a very horrifying impact on that black woman. Right, right. Good, no, yes, so very clearly there on that. Right, and, 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 just, and just the reason why I'm bringing that one up is, I'm starting to hate the word teachable moment. I get that. Because it seems now like the network is starting to kind of use that as an excuse to, hey, well, why don't we give this other person who did this heinous thing a shot because this is a teachable moment for them. It's funny because I've listened to you talk about this and you're so right. And it's such a great perspective 
into that and like where is the benefit where is the damage to the person doing it where is the damage to the viewers and you actually made me really think a lot about that uh as well in a way that i hadn't considered it but and i look at it this way too like for example we talked about kyle and garcelle now that was a teachable moment but the reason why that was a teachable moment was because kyle wanted to learn like yeah. kyle was open to it and kyle and I didn't want to say Kyle wanted to, it was more like Kyle was open to what Garcelle had to say. And then in turn, her response was, oh, I never thought about it that way before. Yeah. That's a teachable moment. But Kyle was open to learn as opposed to, I called the cops on this black woman and now I need to, apologize which by the way they have yet to do they have not i don't think to this day apologized to her um and i want to keep my job so i'm gonna be taught to keep my job on this show i think that's the difference totally well also i think in speaking to that because you're right because the te even the phrase teachable moment sort of implies exterior influence like you know guiding and direction and people into a situation to achieve a result Whereas with Kyle and Garcelle, we watched two people who like have respected each other and gotten along say, this is a thing between us and our friendship as it develops that I wanted, that I choose to talk through, right? That Garcelle wanted to, that's from her, not from like, we want to use this as an opportunity. Because I think a lot about the way you've talked about of like, that the onus shouldn't be on that one black person in the cast, that one Asian woman in the cast, to carry the torch of being a person and a character and a representative of an entire community. Always unfair uh, to ask that, right? I, yeah, like, like I don't, I'm sorry, did you have some, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. Mm. No, please. Um, no, because I, I, I was gonna say like, for example, because just what popped out at me, another example to me of a teachable moment would be Ebony and Sonia. Because yes. I got to tell you, Sonia Morgan is blowing me away right now in a good Well, it's also, I've always thought Sonia's one of my favorite people on the show because she, there, she's always been like in her own planet and also strangely perceptively like sage wisdom. You know, she'll be like, is Sonia even there? And then she's like, well, this is how Luann has lived her entire life. And it's spot on. So it's almost not surprising that Sonia's the one that's been receiving all of this and been able to distill it down to a lot of the core asks and understandings that black people are asking white people to achieve. And what I love in watching the two of them is also Ebony celebrating Sonia, like not in the race conversation, as a person right. in a way that's like, you've been beaten down by like life, by your friends who sort of treat you like a fool. And like, I want to celebrate that. And then seeing that Sonia has been as perceptively aware of the of the core tenets of this conversation. I mean, that budding, doing, budding duo is one of my favorite things to happen on New York in years. And it's so interesting because other than them showing Sonia drunk the few times that they have, like her extremely drunk, she's not the buffoon this season. No. At all. And it's also, it's a reminder that sometimes I think and probably in life, maybe, you know, the journey of being married into one of like the wealthiest families in the world, that like playing at the buffoon is a like defense mechanism choice, you know, through life. It's like when we self-deprecate, if I'm laughing, you can't laugh at me uh, kind of thing. And I love seeing Ebony go, you don't always need to do that, essentially, right? She's saying like, you can, you can stand in the power of who you are, uh, but to your teachable moment, you shouldn't have to, right? You shouldn't have to teach me. It's it's work in your life to do that. But Ebony making the conscious choice to continuously re-engage these women, to point out where they're not listening or to point out where understanding can be achieved. I'm incredibly grateful as a viewer that she's choosing to take on something she shouldn't have to because one, she also clearly enjoys it. She knows that it is, that, <clears throat> that the way she can talk about things and respond to someone and keep her, her pulling Ramona onto that couch after Ramona walked into the other room to basically do a confessional to her dog. Right. Like she was like, oh, I'm gonna shoot, I'm just gonna shoot what I like wanna say right now. 
Ebony literally physically wrapped her back into the scene to say, we can do this. You know, the choice to do that is amazing because she doesn't have to, shouldn't have to. Um, but I think it's benefiting all of us. And it's really having a lot of the Roni audience reveal themselves by saying they think it's boring because those are the same people who saying, I just want my housewives to be fun, da, 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 that it were like, I just want my football to be about football when Colin Kaepernick kneeled. All he did was kneel. Why are you ruining my football? Ebony talking about moving through the world as a black woman is somehow ruining your experience of this TV show. That says a lot about you. Now, I gotta tell you, Emerson, I am not so evolved. So I've been cussing a lot of people out on Bravo well, groups lately. And you get to, right? I mean, I hope you're receiving that that's my point. That like, yeah, Ebony yeah. shouldn't have to. Her choice to is benefiting all of us but you should not, you should not have to sit and pander and wait through. And also particularly with strangers on a microphone. And, and, and the reason why I've been casting people out and it's not, and it's not even the fact that if someone were to say, hey, what Ebony's doing is not my thing. Okay, fine, cool. We all are entitled to our opinions. We all have things that work for us and what don't. What's pissing me off is when people are like, Ebony's ruining the show. Correct. She's hijacking the show. She's making it, um, this is an edited show. Right. And they see what they want you to see. They have yeah. hundreds of, and you, you've done, you know, probably from experience, there's probably shit tons of footage that they had on you guys that they did not use, right? Yes. It's like, this is the thread they are choosing to tell. So Ebony's story is focused on this, but also this makes me bonkers about people even separate from like the not so veiled racism of saying like, it's her fault, she's ruining the show. Like you could say Ebony's a little pedantic and I would say, you know what? Because as someone who is often accused of the same thing when I get on a soapbox, I relate very much to her. Like, <laughs> like I have an argument to laid out. I have a plan for sharing my experiences with you all. I like, I feel seen by that degree of preparation. That's one kind of like commentary about a show, but the like you're ruining my show become is where you get into like, that's racist. Because like Luann has like, I am in the category of like Luann and Ramona, I'm ready for them to graduate. Like you have nothing new yes. to give, except for like Ramona's reaction to this is amazing to watch from the perspective of it is how so many people engage on these issues. It's hard, it's uncomfortable. And when you have the privilege to walk away from it whenever you want, it's, I think a lot of people are uncomfortable because it's like, that's what they look like when they walk out of a conversation. Because if you say to me, Emerson, this felt racist to me when you said this. And I go, oh, you know, I just, I'm so busy. I have vertigo, I've got to go. Like you get one of those before you're like, mm, sir, you just don't want to be called out. Uh, <clears throat> and fans are sort of demonstrating the same behavior right. by attributing all the problems to Ebony, instead of going, they shot this during a lockdown, everyone's exhausted. Our emotional reactions to the lockdowns were so varied across all of us. Uh, a lot of oh. things contributed to this season. The week of the election. Yes. The week of the election that took a week. Like, I mean, wow. just that they were sitting over there as uh, during that election time, I remember like we were all going, is the world ending? Right. You know what's happening? But also just Ebony's digging and digging and digging, digging of like, Ramona, I just want you to give one version of your defense of who, of who you are and what you align with. Like, that's all. And, and at this time that Ebony was talking about this, everybody was talking about this. Yes, it was the only thing anyone was talking about. I mean, like the, the bonkers nature of like pretending like, oh, I just wanna, ah, everywhere you went, anywhere, social media, any conversation, we were all stuck on our couches, you know, it was the only conversation in America that week. And, and I'm trying to like, so because I'm trying to think when they went to Salem, had the election even been decided yet? I didn't even think it had been decided. Yet. I don't know where they are dates wise. I know some of the like Bravo super sleuths have like, like all of the calendar timeline. I'm not sure how many days later. I think it was month. the 13th someone was saying. That feels like then that that was after the weekend where it was like, Trump's ignoring it, but like Fox News call, you know, called Arizona. Right. And I think we were into the like, he hasn't accepted it, but it's been sort of called by the network. Right. 
So then if you put it into context like that, that's where everybody's head was at, not yeah. just her. Correct. Yeah. And, yeah. And I know this might be like controversial on my end, but like a lot of people are like, Leah needs to shut up. Ba -da 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 -da. I actually appreciate the fact that Leah is staying in Ebony's corner and going to bat for her. I actually appreciate that. Yes, there's, you know, I, people are definitely having the like sophomore slump thing with Leah. And I have a lot of empathy for all of the women and all of the franchises that were shot during lockdown. Because like three months into lockdown, I had lost 10 pounds, had to go back to the doctor, get new anxiety medication. You know, so I'm trying to give room for lots of extreme kinds of reactions to little things from all of the women that shot during lockdown and Leah and that grandmother and that weekend and right. Effie's grandmother. So, but I actually, I watched Leah in this most recent conversation and thought that's closer to what I aspire to be, I think, mm -hmm. in these conversations. You know, I don't want to take it over from you, obviously speaking as a black man, right. but I also want to be vocal enough that I'm supporting what you are, you know what I mean? Because there's a like sit idly by thing that's not enough. And there's a like speaking over you that's too much. Mm -hmm. And I actually, my perspective of Lee, I was like, I hope that's actually closer to where I would be landing, supporting you in a conversation. You know, like I, I don't want to speak right. over you or articulate for you, but if someone goes afield, I can go, no, wait, come back. We're in this. That, I, I received it like you did, I think. And having been a person in situations like that, yeah. trust me, if someone like that, like Leah would speak up, I appreciate that, yeah. you know, if, if, because it wasn't, she was speaking up, but it wasn't like she was trying to smooth things over and saying, oh no, they mean, like trying yeah. to, to say, oh no, they don't mean this, they mean this. No, she was calling it out. And I like that she, you could tell that she had Ebony's back. And yeah. I think that Ebony could tell that too. Yeah. Another thing that I like, and I this might be controversial too, because I've heard rumblings, I like the fact that they are showing that for Sean and Ebony have a difference of opinion. Yeah, Be I feel like, I mean, uh, again, I'm speaking gingerly into, but you know, I feel like the hardest part of the way <laughs> quote unquote diversity gets added to things is like single representation is so hard because as we know, no marginalized group, no minority group is a monolith. There are different experiences. Right. Now, if, if one of the white women were using that conflict, that's dangerous and bad, but right. seeing two different kinds of black women feel differently about how to engage in that is, is a reflection of reality. Um, right. I like seeing Ebony's frustration with her. I think for Sean's eye roll a little bit, because those don't, those feel like personality things, right? She's like, right. she's a little preachy and she's like, you're not quite serious enough with these ladies who need to learn. I, I think that's a nuance that's surprising. Right. And I don't agree with, I don't agree with Rashad. I don't agree with her, but I am happy that they're showing this because if it were you, Emerson, and another white person, you two wouldn't automatically get along because you're white. Correct. Yeah. And of course we have the benefit of like what either one of us does isn't then used as an example of how all white people behave. You know, it's the permanent right. benefits of privilege, but the close, the further we get in all of this, the more of that we get to see, because that's, you know, it's where you get over onto our, our predominantly black franchises where you get to see like, oh, here's all different kinds of black women personalities. Right. But even then you see like the Potomac thing where they're like, yeah, but no matter what, we still represent as a group, all of us, you know, uh, that are interesting conversations to watch too. Well, okay, so with the um, with the Potomac thing back with the Monique and yep. Candace fight, yep. a lot of people had a problem with the women sitting Monique down and the women on their own having that conversation saying, you know, we got to be careful because as Black women, we, you know, we have to watch that stuff. Yep. I did not have a problem with them having that conversation because once again, this is stuff that I've experienced myself personally where people do expect the black person to be violent or people do, you know, have 
their feelings and what their prejudices about black people. And so I get them saying, hey, we are on national television and we cannot give these people evidence and fuel to back up their, their bigotry. You know, yeah. I, as a matter of fact, okay. So I have since left a lot of these Facebook bra Bravo groups yeah. because of racism, but okay. So you see them talk about uh, the Potomac fight and how that was disgusting. They're like animals. How can they do that? But then you point out that, oh, well, on the Royal Housewives of New Jersey, two yep. men had a brawl in yep. the middle of a hotel. Yes. And like, you're, you're fine with that. That man fully rubbed the just for men off his head on <laughs> right. another man. Yes. Well, here's here's the thing in my personal journey, right? I I I talk about aspiring to be an inconsistent hypocrite. And by that, I mean, I don't always wanna be hypocritical the same way, right? Like I don't wanna make sure that if I'm saying like, ooh, that's trashy, it's not always at the group of black women doing a thing. Like that's a representation of a bigoted opinion, like that's uh -huh. based in bigotry, as opposed to sometimes being like, I don't like that black woman when she yells, I don't like that white woman when she yells, I don't, you know, does that make sense? Like I wanna yeah, make sure yeah. that, that where my judgment, so to speak, isn't always in the same kind of lane because then it's just like people opinions. But right. where we do have to examine is if you're only calling out one kind of the visual of the thing that speaks to uh, at least an unconscious bias at the very most. And I don't think we want our people, you know, I don't need that. I don't want to just see the right opinions. That's not right. the goal for any of us here, right? But what we want to make sure is that like the viewers and the women aren't experiencing the same kind of like discrimination-based opinions and experience often enough to, to ruin their experience or the audience's experience. Right, and, and, and you know, and, and by the way, just for the record, I don't think Monique should have beat the crap out of Candace either. Like I, right. you know, but. I, that, and it's also where people get so sensitive, like that is a fine opinion to have. Like, ma'am, that was too much. Yeah. It's an okay opinion. When you get to the like white people going like those ratchet girls, right? That is different. And it's like the first is an opinion of a of a fight. The second right. is you're bringing bigotry into your judgment of a thing. Right. And, and marginalized people can always see the difference as well. Yeah. You know, and and um, I'm definitely curious to see how New York is going to play out. Yeah especially with Luann, especially with Ramona. It, okay, do you get the weird sense though, that even though Ramona is acting like an idiot, like doing her dancing thing and all that stuff, do you, I kind of get the feeling that, and, we'll, and time will tell, right. I kind of get the feeling that yes, she might, feel that extreme, but she's also putting on a show. Yes. Oh, always. Like the grand hypocrisy of Ramona Singer is that one, she's not the brightest bulb in the New York chandelier. Let's start there. And so as a result, her attempts to create good television are always very apparent. Right. And her like attempts to change like a subject or a direction are like so flagrantly obvious that like we get such unintended comedy out of her like forced attempts you know, it's like when she looks at someone and isn't listening at all to anything that they have to say, like waiting for her turn to talk, or when she won't respond to someone because she thinks if I don't give you anything, they won't use this, like she did to Elise for a whole season. Right. Um, it's one of the joys of Ramona. I just feel like I'm at the point where I've seen everything Ramona Singer has to give. No, it's time for her to, it's, it's time for her to graduate. I agree with you and Luann as well, even though I, uh, even though Luann and her antics, I do have a soft spot for Luann only because she's so goddamn snotty. <laughs> I mean, I, it's, I would rather, honestly, I'd rather be done after this season because she's a part of the central thing and that's great with right. Ramona completely and let Luann be a friend because that right. like back and forth between the countess and the like cool girl is, is one of the great fun things to watch. 
but we've reached the point where like they go on vacation and I know like Ramona is going to be rude to the staff. She's going to run to the biggest room. They're going to get drunk at night and fall down. You know, there's some familiar that's good. And then there's the point at which predictable becomes like not as fun. And I think that's the bigger problem this season is that with nothing to do in the world, right? there's not new opinions really from like the Ramona Luann side of the table, if that makes sense. Um, so, and I will stick by this. I think the best Luann seasons ever, in my opinion, was the, that season or those couple of seasons where she got demoted. Yes. That was the best Luann. Because- I mean, when she was fighting for that app to get that apple back, I mean, she's responding, like that moment when she was yelling at Bethany and went outside and Jules was on the phone with like her father in the hospital and Luann like completely ignored Jules just to be like, yeah, but she was mean to me. It's like one of my favorite moments in all of Housewives history, like that level of delusional self-involvement is what I show up for in the first place. Because, you know, remember when she was demoted was when don't be all, be cool, yes. don't be all uncool. Yes, not really. <laughs> I mean, like all of us say that in our real lives. Now. Like, that's not really. Like we do, like she is lexicon. It is amazing. And, and where I'm hoping with going, where they're going with New York is, I'm going to use another word that people get annoyed with. I do hope that they take us on a journey whereas at the end of this season, the women will have evolved a little bit. Yeah. That's what I'm hoping. Yeah. You know, but um, well, it looks like we're winding down, but before we go, Emerson, so what would you, what do you want to see from, from our shows going, our stories? Cause I, I like calling them the stories too. Yes, what of course you, they are. What do you want to see from the stories going forward or speaking of evolution how do you want to see the stories evolve well in our stories because they are i mean these are our soap operas these are the like that they're these women are basically fictional in my life like in a good way you know like i don't want to i don't want to encounter the real people i like them as my fantastical fictional figures i actually really love this direction and i think it's you know for lack of a better you know there's a pendulum that swings when you try to start new conversations And I'm hoping that as we move beyond the first round of conversations, it'll settle back. They will settle in a central place where it does move like real life back and forth between like absurd and comedy and real and sincere and uncomfortable conversations. These, that is much closer to all of our real reality. I have been called out. I have been called in and then laughed with that person the next day. You know, that's so much more of our reality. And I think as, the women learn and the editors learn and the network learns how to blend those threads. That makes the best possible show. What I love most about Housewives is showing up and not knowing what I'm gonna get tonight. You know, I don't know if it's gonna be like knee slapping hilarity, if there's gonna be some tragedy we didn't know about and see and like have our heartstrings tugged or like see uncomfortable conversations. The more variety we get, the better it is for all of us, for me as a viewer. Uh, now, okay, so so Dallas, do you think it should be come back? You should come okay, back. Okay, you know what? I'm back? from my family's in Dallas. So oh, really? I'm always, I'm a, like bring it back because that's the like that's real. That's so much of the South, right? Like we don't talk about it. It's off to the side. Why are you making this weird? It's on you. I think Tiffany Moon is a rock star <gasps> of Love a her. woman, of a character, of a I like I'm enamored with her foibles, with her intelligence, with the conflicted nature of her relationship with her mother. I mean, the open heart that Tiffany Moon is, you know, just in so many ways, to me is single-handedly enough for that franchise to continue, whether it's her and Deandra and like all a whole new world, whatever. And, and it's so crazy because my mom is from Texas as well. Um, uh, my, mom, my mom's from San Antonio, uh, but um, it, the, the thing, and, and I, I agree as far as that, sh- Dallas can be safe. Yeah. I do think they do need to get rid of camera. I do yes. think after what the Westcots did to Tiffany yes. off camera, they yeah. need to go. Yeah. Um, but, and, and they can diversify. Yeah. There are rich people of color in Texas. Yes. I know yeah. a couple. <laughs> like, and, and also, because let's not pretend like so many of the totally white lady seasons of shows have had women introduced who barely knew the other people's names before. So the idea that you can't be like, great, we're looking for something and these people sort of know each other because of this thing. We have had far less tenuous thread connections between new white ladies 
So it is absolutely possible. Because remember, they did have a show called Texicanas. Oh my God, I loved, to, like, you know, not to like, because we're ending, but I love all of the off-brand offshoots. I, I love Texicanas so much. I am, because I'm loving Family Karma. Oh, and Family loving Karma, it. the scene with Amrit and his grandmother and watching his parents talk, like that, that coming out story across those two episodes was to me one of the most uh, nuanced portrayals and Nicholas talking about his very conservative Christian family at the same right. time, like gay people on the network ever, that they're just so joyful and they cannot help but just be who they are in camera. I, if people are not watching, it, the first season is short, Dive in, binge, and join us. Do not sleep on Family Karma. Correct. Seriously, do not sleep on that. Another show I think needs to come back. I'm bummed. Mexican Dynasties. I love Mexican Dynasties. Oh my Dynasties. gosh. We, the Allendes, like we keep joking. I'm like, I need them. Like the gay and his best friend and like the kids, like yes. the casting of that show and like the delusional pop star career. I'm like, is he recording? Right. What's happening? I love them. Right. What was his name? I, I um, not it's on a, the Allende side, I forget. Yeah. Sunday Wait, one. who, and some of, one of them got divorced. Oh, I, I didn't realize. One of them, I think the son, remember um, the Allende older son, I think they got divorced or they're getting divorced. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The right. older one where it was like, why are you always like, how, yes. Oh, right. there was a but, lot of pain there. Yeah, but yeah, these, yeah, definitely, you know, uh, the offshoot shows, yeah, Family Karma is just, unbelievable this season it's hilarious and touching and like i love it so much anyway emerson okay so you need to come back literally anytime i i meant it when i said it you know i enjoy you so much i enjoy your perspective you talk about stuff in ways i haven't considered for that lets me be a part of the conversation too you're hilarious i Thank always you. make me laugh out loud <laughs> when people are like doing the frou-frou version and you jump in with listen <laughs> I just enjoy so much. So literally anytime. It's my great pleasure. And we need to hang out. We yeah. totally need to hang out. It's funny because yeah. we're both and in I'm LA. to see your show. Yay! Yay! Um, yeah, God. Ugh. And, and I've talked I about this. Be. I hope it, all your listeners know how much you do and how lucky they are to have your insights and humor. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, listeners, I'm actually in a, I'm in the middle of a show right now. I'm in the middle of previews of a show. Um, I, know, I know I mentioned it on Clubhouse. They're doing, Hasbro is doing a live version of Clip. Ugh. And what makes it difficult in a good way, it's, it's you're, you're an actress too, you know, it's yeah. challenging. Mm -hmm. so, so this was all conceived back when we weren't sure if we were going to go back into indoor space. Right. So this is conceived, it's, it's an actual show, but it's an immersion show. And so Hasbro thinking outside of the box and not knowing whether or not we were gonna get theaters back made a deal with Westfield. So this is going on at Westfield Century City. That's so amazing. So there's sets like in the middle of Century, like of the mall, yes. there's like actual sets. Oh my gosh. And and so, and so it's kind of cool because I thought this was going to be, I misheard them. So I thought that it was going to be a two week contract. It's a 10 week contract, <laughs> <laughs> which is good because I'm employed. Yes. I'm employed until this Happy to have the gigs, but that like 400% increase in your booking time. Oh, okay. <laughs> Wild. <laughs> so it's cool. So it's cool because I'm like, yay, I'm employed. You know, yeah. I, I'm employed, so it's guaranteed check until September, but um, it, it's fun. So yeah, check it out. Um, you can find out about it on Clue Live and actually the previews. Um, there's supposedly uh, a couple of names coming today. I'll tell you off camera. Off, yes, Fanny, Fanny. Off camera, because they were like, this this person's coming. And I'm like, oh, really? But, <laughs> oh, <yay! laughs> but Emerson, how can, we find you. How can the listeners find you? Uh, my website is emersoncollins.com. You can send me your love, hate, whatever. On Instagram, it's at emersoncollins and on Twitter at actually emerson. Great. So follow him, comment. You can also find him on Clubhouse. Yes. Which, you know, I know I don't shut up about Clubhouse on this podcast, but if you're not on Clubhouse, you're really missing out. 
because, you know, we were just talking about Ebony a couple of weeks ago. I got to talk to Ebony. Yeah. I got to talk to her. And it's cool because in Clubhouse, you literally never know who's going to pop it. Yes. And you can talk as long as you want. Yeah. Yeah. So I've talked to Ebony. I've actually, I've talked to Ebony twice. The second time I talked to her, she actually remembered me from the first time. And that's you know, not surprising from her. Whereas, you know, it's like Ramona's met like somebody 70 times and it's like, it's so nice to meet you. Right. I've, I've talked to, you know, Tiffany, Jill Zarin. Yes. Jill's yeah. always around. So, so yeah. So get, get, get on Clubhouse. And you know what? If you need invites, I've got a bunch backed up. So just hit me up. And, and that's it. I gotta, you know, I gotta, I gotta get on to my life now. What time? I got, I've got to, I said, I'm such a housewife, speaking of housewives, I'm like, I got a kid to pick up at summer camp in a couple of hours. <laughs> oh my gosh, makes you much closer to an actual housewife than a number of our housewives. Let's be real. <laughs> <laughs> so every, so Emerson, you hold on and everyone else until next time, readers, keep reading. Bye.